Moby Dick or the Whale by Herman Melville, chapter 89, Fast Fish and Loose Fish. The allusion to the waif and waif poles in the last chapter but one necessitates some account of the laws and regulations of the whale fishery, of which the waif may be deemed the grand symbol and badge. It frequently happens that when several ships are cruising in company, a whale may be struck by one vessel, then escape, and be finally killed and captured by another vessel, and herein are indirectly comprised many minor contingencies, all partaking of this one grand feature. For example, after a weary and perilous chase and capture of a whale, the body may get loose from the ship by reason of a violent storm, and drifting far away to leeward be retaken by a second whaler who, in a calm, snugly tows it alongside without risk of life or line. Thus, the most vexatious and violent disputes would often arise between the fishermen, were there not some written or unwritten universal undisputed law applicable to all cases. Perhaps the only formal whaling code authorized by legislative enactment was that of Holland. It was decreed by the States General in A.D. 1695. But though no other nation has ever had any written whaling law, yet the American fishermen have been their own legislators and lawyers in this matter. They have provided a system which for terse comprehensiveness surpasses Justinian's pandects and the bylaws of the Chinese society for the suppression of meddling with other people's business. Yes, these laws might be engraven on a Queen Anne's farthing or the barb of a harpoon and worn round the neck, so small are they. Number one, a fast fish belongs to the party fast to it. Number two, a loose fish is fair game for anybody who can soonest catch it. But what plays the mischief with this masterly code is the admirable brevity of it, which necessitates a vast volume of commentaries to expound it. First, what is a fast fish? Alive or dead, a fish is technically fast when it is connected with an occupied ship or boat by any medium at all controllable by the occupant or occupants, a mast, an oar, or a nine-inch cable, a telegraph wire, or a strand of cobweb. It is all the same. Likewise, a fish is technically fast when it bears a waif or any other recognized symbol of possession, so long as the party waving it plainly evince their ability at any time to take it alongside, as well as their intention so to do. These are scientific commentaries, but the commentaries of the whalemen themselves sometimes consist in hard words and harder knocks, the coke upon little tin of the fist. True, among the more upright and honorable whalemen, allowances are always made for peculiar cases, or it would be an out outrageous moral injustice for one party to claim possession of a whale previously chased or killed by another party. But others are by no means so scrupulous. Some 50 years ago, there was a curious case of whale trover litigated in England, wherein the plaintiff set forth that after a hard chase of a whale in the northern seas, and when indeed they, the plaintiffs, had succeeded in harpooning the fish, they were at last, through peril of their lives, obliged to forsake not only their lines, but their boat itself. Ultimately, the defendants, uh, the crew of another ship, came up with the whale, struck, killed, seized, and finally appropriated it before the very eyes of the plaintiffs. And when those defendants were remonstrated with, their captain snapped his fingers in the plaintiff's teeth and assured them that by way of doxology to the deed he had done, he would now retain their line, harpoons, and boat, which had remained attached to the whale at the time of the seizure. Wherefore, the plaintiffs now sued for the recovery of the value of their whale, line, harpoons, and boat. Mr. Erskine was counsel for the defendants. Lord Ellenborough was the judge. 
In the course of the defense, the witty Erskine went on to illustrate his position by alluding to a recent uh, crimcon case wherein a gentleman, after in vain trying to bridle his wife's viciousness, had at last abandoned her upon the seas of life. But in the course of years, repenting of that step, he instituted an action to recover possession of her. Erskine was on the other side, and he then supported it by saying that though the gentleman had originally harpooned the lady and had once had her fast, and only by reason of the great stress of her plunging viciousness had at last abandoned her, yet abandon her he did, so that she became a loose fish. And therefore, when a subsequent gentleman re-harpooned her, the lady then became that subsequent gentleman's property, along with whatever harpoon might have been found sticking in her. Now, in the present case, Erskine contended that the examples of the whale and the lady were reciprocally illustrative of each other. These pleadings and the counter pleadings being duly heard, the very learned judge in set terms decided to wit that as for the boat, he awarded it to the plaintiffs because they had merely abandoned it to save their lives. But that with regard to the controverted whale, harpoons, and line, they belonged to the defendants. The whale, because it was a loose fish at the time of the final capture, and the harpoons and line, because when fish made off with them, it, the fish, acquired a property in those articles, and hence anybody who afterwards took the fish had a right to them. Now the defendants afterwards took the fish, ergo, the aforesaid articles were theirs. A common man looking at this decision of the very learned judge might possibly object to it, but plowed up to the primary rock of the matter, the two great principles laid down in the twin whaling laws previously quoted and applied and elucidated by Lord Ellenborough in the above cited case. These two laws touching fast fish and loose fish, I say, will, on reflection, be found the fundamentals of all human jurisprudence. For notwithstanding its complicated tracery of sculpture, the temple of the law, like the temple of the Philistines, has but two props to stand on. It is not a saying in everyone's mouth, possession is half of the law. That is regardless of how the thing came into possession, isn't it? But often possession is the whole of the law. What are the sinews and souls of Russian serfs and Republican slaves, but fast fish? Whereof possession is the whole of the law. What to the rapacious landlord is the widow's last might, but a fast fish? What is yonder undetected villain's marble mansion with a door plate for a waif? What is that but a fast fish? What is the ruinous discount which Mordecai the broker gets from poor Wobegon the bankrupt on a loan to keep Wobegon's family from starvation? What is that ruinous discount but a fast fish? What is the Archbishop of Save Soul's income of a hundred thousand pounds seized from the scant bread and cheese of hundreds of thousands of broken back laborers, all sure of heaven without any of Save Soul's help? What is that globular of a hundred thousand pounds but a fast fish? What are the Duke of Dunder's hereditary towns and hamlets but fast fish? What to that redoubted harpooner John Bull is poor Ireland? but a fast fish. What to that apostolic lancer, brother Jonathan, is Texas, but a fast fish. And concerning all these, is not possession the whole of the law? But if the doctrine of fast fish be pretty generally applicable, the kindred doctrine of loose fish is still more widely so, that it internationally and universally is applicable. What was America in 1492 but a loose fish in which Columbus struck the Spanish standard by way of waiting it for his royal master and mistress? What was Poland to the czar? What 
Greece to the Turk, what India to England, what at last will Mexico be to the United States? All loose fish. What are the rights of man and the liberties of the world but loose fish? What all men's minds and opinions but loose fish? What is the principle of a rel religious belief in them but a loose fish? What to the ostentatious smuggling verbalists are the thoughts of thinkers but loose fish? What is the great globe itself but a loose fish? And what are you, reader, but a loose fish and a fast fish, too? <laughs>